Well, I want to welcome you tonight. I'm Jack Holland. I'm a professor of pastoral counseling at Emmanuel Christian Seminary. So, welcome to you from Emmanuel Christian Seminary. I uh, want to, first of all, recognize Calvin and Nancy Ross, who have generously funded uh, this lectureship. They do so in memory of Calvin's parents, Walter and Mardell Ross. So, we join you tonight in Thank you for your generosity in funding this lecture. It's, a, it's my special privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Kyle Colvett, Colvett, who I think is probably pretty familiar to a lot of you in the, in the medical community. Uh, this is our first encounter with Dr. Colvett at Emmanuel, and it's just been a really delightful opportunity to, to meet him and to, to learn some of his uh, perspective. He, he did a wonderful job in the lecture yesterday, and so we look forward to his time tonight. Uh, Dr. Colbett is the Director of Oncology Services at Johnson City Medical Center. Uh, he's been ele elected President of the medical staff three times. He's, he also has extensive ministry experience, has taken a number of medical mission trips, uh, has written many peer-reviewed articles as well as uh, article chapters for textbooks. So, well qualified. We uh, so much appreciate uh, what he has has been bringing to us tonight. He's going to be speaking on the topic "Worthless Physicians When Comforters Move Beyond Their Role." So, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cole. Thank you, Jack. Can you, can you hear me well? All right, good. I'm, I'm, I appreciate your attendance tonight. Um, we uh, are delighted to continue in a dialogue, a dialogue between the medical community and the spiritual and pastoral community in, in Johnson City. And I hope that our time fosters that and continues that uh, cross-pollination relationship. Uh, it's noteworthy that several institutions in that realm are celebrating important anniversaries uh, this year. Uh, the College of Nursing at ETSU recently celebrated its 60th anniversary. It's the largest enrollment of any College of Nursing in the state of Tennessee. Uh, the College of Medicine is uh, celebrating its 40th anniversary uh, with uh, a series of uh, events and celebrations coming up in the next few weeks. And it's my understanding that Emmanuel is on the cusp of its 50th anniversary as an institution. Uh, and with that, commentary, we recognize that each of those uh, and the allied uh, relationships with uh, the hospital system, the other programs at the university, with Milligan College, uh, that we have a presence in our community. And I think a presence of scholars and people with particular talents requires and provides a responsibility uh, to, in service and presence. And it's, it's my hope that lectures and pastoral care and the dialogue around those fosters those ends uh, to make life better uh, for the people uh, in our region. So I appreciate your attendance tonight. Uh, Calvin, I will tell you that traveling 8,000 miles to be here to hear me speak is Dr. Mike Davis. <clears throat> and so if the Ross lectures continue on for decades, uh, test every year to see if anyone travels further for other speakers uh, to see that. Uh, I, I think I'll set the bar pretty high for that. Um, so yesterday we had opportunity to speak at a manual uh, with a, a topic that uh, I've used in, in teaching medical students, but I, I changed it just a bit, the idea of metaphor, how we, how we use metaphor in our communications in pastoral settings and in medical settings and how that can be a, a useful tool uh, and at other times how that can be a barrier uh, and an unintended barrier to the effective communication that we'd like to have. Uh, is the microphone working well? I just wanted to test that. Is there, am I getting some um, echo phenomena when I turn? So I should not turn? All right. <laughs> I'm going to have to turn occasionally to see what slide I'm on, so I apologize if that uh, gives us a blip in, in our hearing. Uh, tonight we'll, we're speaking in an idea based on uh, ancient scripture, the ancient story of Job, and how that might have some bearing on present relationships and communications. Uh, tomorrow morning at 11 uh, at uh, Emmanuel, I'll be speaking with uh, what, what sounds like a, what, what sounds like a, a bit of a, a, a gritty uh, technical topic, uh, the idea of the biopsychosocial model that we use in medicine. 
with a query as to where does spiritual matters fit into that model and how can pastoral folk and ministers and physicians integrate spiritual questions in the care of the whole of the patients that we, we take care of. So uh, that'll be tomorrow at 11. Everyone is welcome to join us uh, for that. So I'm going to stand over this way, uh, uh, or maybe, maybe I'll try it this way. <clears throat> try the, how's that doing in terms of uh, you seeing me and hearing with the microphone? All right, good. Thank you for your patience with that. So in the midst of illness and trauma, good people uh, can doubt God. And that doubt can arise in a crisis uh, and it's the deep existential questions that accompany times of crisis. We don't ask those questions when things are going well. Uh, when things are going well, we're, we're rolling along with uh, life as it is. But when crisis comes, when loss occurs, when illness hits us, is when those existential questions arise. And so this is the nexus between health and medicine uh, and, and the spiritual matters. This is why uh, we think it's critical to consider uh, the role of ministry and pastoral care in health care. This raises the questions that are important for us to know. Uh, and so in those times of crisis, we might doubt that God is good, or, or we may doubt that God is powerful, or we may doubt that God cares, and we may even doubt that God exists. Unfortunately, in many faith communities, doubting is not a welcome behavior. It's not something that's voiced. In fact, we, we're not tolerant of doubt sometimes. The kinds of communications that we make, intentionally or unintentionally, squelch doubt, even though it's there. And it may be welling up in the hearts of the people around us. And so the book of Job gives us pause uh, and gives us reflection to consider just what role does doubt play in the believer in the person who's struggling in the seeker when times of crisis arise. The pastoral response to that struggle is at the heart of a confessional response to illness. The story begins, there was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and turned away from evil. Uh, the story begins in a, in a place long ago and far away and hard to find on maps. Uh, and the query is, uh, what application does this story have to me? How am I like Job who lived long ago in a place I don't understand? But what we do know is that we're told from the beginning. There's no mystery as to Job's quality and nature. We're, he is described in full, a man who's upright and blameless. Now, if we believe and work in a, a very direct, mechanical way of understanding the universe, then upright and blameless people will have great lives in which good things always happen to them. And by the corollary, when bad things happen, we can assume quite quickly that maybe there's something not so upright and not so righteous about that person's life. If we believe that system, and if that's the way that the universe operates, whether you're a believer or not, that, that recompense comes directly in proportion to the behavior and quality of the person, then Job's going to have some serious questions for us. Because as the story opens, the uh, accuser, the prosecuting attorney character in our story, sometimes called Satan, goes to God and said, sure, Job loves you. Sure, he's your favorite, but everything's going great for Job. What if the quality of Job's life changed? What if the circumstances surround him changed? Then what would happen? I propose a test, and the test begins. Now, if indeed the association between righteousness and, uh, and success, and we'll define that any way you wish, is a direct one, uh, well, then I suppose that God's most favorite people in the world today are people like uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And his, some of his least favorite are seminary students and medical students who are deeply in debt. <laughs> if that is the mechanical association we'll make. But in Job, the question is deeper. I'll have a few art uh, selections for you tonight in the story of Job. This is a, a statue by Mestrovich. There's the character of Job in a painful position. Hard to recognize a human there in the pain that he expresses in a closer view as he cries out. Because what happened to Job was he was wealthy, 
Uh, the story lists the oxen and the sheep and the cattle and the wealth that he has and the family that he has, and he loses all of those one after another. And then, as if that weren't enough, his own health fails him. He, he develops boils, a, a terrible circumstance where he is in great agony and pain. Now, Job was blessed because he had friends. He had people who cared about him. And his three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Naamathite, gathered together to find him. May be hard to find those places on the map, but the story is, is that's not so nearby. There was intentional effort necessary in his three friends to get together, to hear of his calamity, and to decide to go be with him. It was a presence in the presence of someone who's suffering that they chose to do. And here we can praise Bildad and Eliphaz. Here we can claim, if I could have friends like that, who leave their homes and travel great distances when I am in terrible circumstances. And so wonderful friends that he has. Now when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. The last time they saw Job, life was good, health was uh, the way it ought to be. Children were running around and the cattle were happy. Uh, and now they don't recognize him because he's changed physically and he's changed in ways uh, that, are, that is apparent from a distance. And so they raised their voices and wept aloud and they tore their robes. They threw dust in the air upon their heads and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his suffering was very great. I'm not certain I have friends that good. I'm not certain that, that a friend that can come and sees in the turmoil and pain and has compassion, they are moved to share in the suffering with him. And so they sit on the ground for a full week of days and nights, not speaking, but sharing in the suffering and being present at a time when it seems that everything else has abandoned Job. If the story ended here, the title of the book would not be Job. It would be the three wonderful friends that we all wish we had. If the story ended here, we would praise them through the centuries as men who showed compassion for the lost, and we would hold them up as parade examples of the kinds of people we ought to do. But the story and the title of the speech tonight is of worthless physicians because they don't remain silent. They don't remain merely supportive in their presence. It's when they stop being friends and becoming theologians that the difficulty arises. These are some uh, 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 old etchings and drawings from William Blake, the same poet who wrote Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. And if you're bored one night, read about his religious beliefs. That'll keep you up. And uh, it's a, that's a challenging story to understand. Uh, but his uh, etchings and drawings of Old Testament characters are always evocative, and he's way ahead of his time in the art that he shows and the emotions on the faces. And so the bemused appearance of Job on our right and his friends and wife. And Job says, I've heard many such things, miserable comforters that you are. Because after the seven days and nights of quiet presence, they begin to give long speeches. The book of Job is both prose and poetry, and these speeches go on for chapters and chapters. And in the speeches, uh, they suggest that maybe you weren't so upright after all, Job. I know you've got this reputation as being righteous, but there is probably something sneaking around that, that we're not aware of, but the deity knows, and you're just getting what you deserve. So let's go ahead and confess up to it. Let's own up to it. There's no way that the universe works in some other system. And so let us know. Tell us what happens. Confess your sins. Even Job's wife tires of the events. And they speak and speak and speak. And Job calls them worthless comforters, worthless physicians, miserable presence in his, in his life. It is a scathing indictment of his friends that I hope is never attributed to me. We hope is never attributed to us that we would be called worthless physicians, miserable comforters. So what can we learn? What's the fault in Job's friends and what's the upshot of the book? Job 13, 
Now look, my eye has seen all this, my ear has heard and understood it, and what you know I also know. I am not inferior to you, but I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. As for you, you whitewash with lies. All of you are worthless physicians. If you would only keep silent, that would be your wisdom. If you don't remember anything else that I say tonight, there is often great wisdom in silence. And if it takes biting your tongue, and that's what I have to do sometimes, there may be wisdom in that, in the process of pain, in the process of suffering, in the process of trying to be a comforter. Now, um, a passage here from chapter 6, I'm, I'm skipping in, in an irregular pattern through the book on purpose to keep a theme. Uh, that those who withhold kindness from a friend forsake the fear of the Almighty. And so the, the converse of that is those who do not withhold kindness or on the Almighty's team. That's my paraphrase. My companions are treacherous like a torrent bed, like freshets that pass away, that run dark with ice, turbid with melting snow, but in time of heat they disappear. When it's hot, they vanish from their place. So up in the mountains, maybe Mount Hermon, it's a wide river. By the time it gets to the warm valley below, there's no water left. The friends are present when things are comfortable, but when things are tough, they're dried riverbeds. And so the caravans turn aside from their course and they go up into the waste and perish. The caravans of Tima look, the travelers of Sheba hope, but they're disappointed because they were competent. And they come there and they are confounded. Such you have now become to me. You see my calamity and are afraid. Some of you have been involved in the care of people who were ill who you couldn't recognize them when you saw them. They've lost so much weight. Maybe they've lost their hair. Maybe they don't look like the person you've known. And you're moved with compassion. But there might be an element of fear in that. It's frightening sometimes. It's alien to see someone you know be ill. And Job recognized something deep in the response of his friends. They weren't so much worried about Job after a while. They were worried about Bildad. <laughs> And Eliphaz. There was fear in their own hearts because sickness scared them. And the presence of what seems to be punishment frightened them in this circumstance. And as comforters, sometimes when people are sick, we stay away because it scares us to death. It's not fun to be in the hospital. The hospital is an alien place. The sick bed or the, the imminent death bed is not a, a welcoming place to be. It is foreign to us and it's frightening. It's emotionally uh, uh, terrible. And so Job saw through the fear and the anxiety of his friends. And even though he recognized there may be an origin to it, he indicted them because they weren't the comforters they should have been. Moses ben Maimon or Maimonides or Rambam, a medieval Jewish physician, theologian, wrote a commentary on Job and he observed what has been an ancient query. Is this history? Is this historicity? Is this a true story? Is there a place called us? And he said some of the sages, some of the old Talmudic scholars says, yes, Job is real. And some said, no, it's not. It's a story. It's a story to illustrate things. Uh, and he was careful to note that while some believed that the story happened, there was a difference of opinion. And there was a difference of opinion on if it happened, when it happened. Was it ancient in the time of the patriarchs? Was it the time of David? Was it post-exilic? And no one seemed to agree. And I think that scholars today can still debate just where does Job fit into the canon? Uh, is, it, is it a poetic book? Is it a historical book? And there's time enough for a, in another setting for us to discuss that. But Maimonides seemed to think that the disagreement about time and place uh, just seemed to help support that it was likely a parable since there was this wide disagreement. But this is the most important thing he said, and I wish I'd said it, but he beat me by like 700 years. And he said, Maimonides said that whether Job ever existed or not, cases like his always exist. And that they cause all reflecting people to become perplexed and to turn to one another or another opinions about providence. So whether Job ever existed Cases like Job have always existed. It is a universal story of the struggle of the question of who is God? Is God good? Why do we suffer? 
these theodicy questions that challenge us today. Now, in any good drama, the book of Job ought to end with a nice, neatly tied up package. His friends, and including a later interloper who, who have other speeches to say, have their points, and Job answers them. And finally, in the last chapter, God or his emissary comes down and explains it all cleanly and explains exactly what God's thinking and why he does what he does. But the answer is really not very satisfying. The voice from the whirlwind talks about things that God is and that Job is not those things. Things that God can do and Job cannot do those things. Things that God understands and Job can't understand those things, but he never, ever explains himself. How frustrating. How terribly frustrating because we would love for our books of, of, of Scripture to give us clear answers. So we're left with a wrestling match, a struggle to try to understand just what this means. So God never answers Job's heart questions. Why did this happen to me? And even though Job is restored in a, in a sort of a strange coda that he gets his wealth back and, and family, uh, we're left still not terribly comfortable with the whole story and the events. And his struggle can be a model for the eternal struggle. Job becomes an everyman, a universal application, just as Maimonides said. So illness and injury and the associated suffering are, I believe, the crucible of faith, that place where the heat is applied and physical change happens. And in that crucible, we have to ask, what is our response as we stand in the shoes as Bildad or Eliphaz to the friends around us? How are we going to do a better job? How can we improve upon the worthless positions that Job indicted? There have been a number of books written on these issues. These are just two. Uh, and there are, these are two that are, I've chosen on purpose because they're written more for a general audience. They're not a, a scholarly attack at, at theodicy questions. Uh, but they raise some wonderful points. Both Yancey and C.S. Lewis in the, in the last century have asked about pain and why does this happen to us. C.S. Lewis, the Oxford Don, uh, went through a long period as an agnostic atheist and came round to an unsettled but deep faith. Deep in the sense that he could write eloquently about it, but unsettled because he continued to fight it. This was a continuing struggle. It wasn't a settled law that he says, oh, I get this, and from then on the rest of his life was no questioning. Now he said that we live in a universe that contains much that is bad. That's easily observed. And apparently meaningless. But at the same time, the universe contains creatures like us who somehow know that things are bad and meaningless. And he created us as creatures that recognize the injustice and the emptiness and long for something more. So God did not have to make us this way. God could have made us like fish, swimming around and not noticing much of anything, but he didn't. So why is that? Why is that in his apex of creation, the human being, that he left us recognizing and naming that is suffering, and that is injustice, and that's not the way things ought to be. That recognition that there was a difference between justice and injustice, between fairness and unfairness, is part of that quality of the eternal, that image of God that we're made in. And so when we are encountering suffering, when we're encountering, th encountering things that are injustice, we name them for what they are. And we cry out not, how could a God do this? But a God who created us allows us to see that and name it for what it is. It becomes important for us to approach and to soothe as much as we can suffering and injustice, recognizing that that's an endless task because of the world we live in. But in working against injustice, in working for fairness, in working to ease suffering, we are claiming a right order in the way things ought to be by our Creator. So Lewis said that the outrage we feel at injustice and that cry that wells up within us has been put there by God. And the only reason we recognize injustice at all, that we can even define such a thing, is that we've been created with a God-inherited need for justice, just as we have an inborn need for love and for meaning. So in other words, these are primarily God's questions inside of us, the whys. 
And God's placed these questions in our hearts because he wants us to ask them. And so that means that doubt and uncertainty and questioning and struggling with these questions is not the antithesis of faith, but it's rather faith working its way in a, a universe that's full of absence of meaning. So doubt is the expression of a healthy faith in this setting. And so questioning is not an immature phase to get out of. That's only for the, you know, the teenagers. And once we're past that, we're, we're settled. And it's the hallmark of a mature faith. And when we attempt to explain away these questions, we actually shut off the part of us that cries out for compassion and justice. And when we do that, we shut off a big part of what it means to be human, to continue to fight with the ideas of injustice, to continue to have turmoil about why suffering happens is the worshipful process of faith acting itself out in the world. Philip Yancey talks about having students who came to him struggling with faith and trying to understand, is God real? And he broke uh, into sort of two camps of uh, agnosticism, he says that he challenges these students who are struggling to find a single argument in the, the uh, classic Bertrand Russell, Voltaire, David Hume uh, crowd. Uh, by the way, I went to David Hume's tomb in Edinburgh, and he was not a believer, but his sister was, and so there's lots of Bible verses all over his tomb, which is kind of, <laughs> she got sort of the last laugh there. Um, <clears throat> or or so, the so-called new agnostics like uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. And, and Yancey challenges these students to find a single cogent, coherent argument in these critics of faith and belief that God has not already put in his own scripture. So books like the Psalms, Job, Habakkuk, Lamentations, these cry out of, why are you doing this, God? This doesn't make sense. Why are bad things going on? Please make yourself known. Please explain yourself. So ancient people have struggled to understand why God does what he does and to understand this. And in this doubt is the working out of that struggle. Yet modern day people, we seem to know much better than the ancient prophets. Because we believe that any doubt is to be, in, to be not tolerated, to not be welcomed, to not be spoken aloud, to be kept hushed. So we're not very doubt tolerant. It is not coincidental that whoever ordered the Psalms placed Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right before the Lord is my shepherd, I will want for nothing. The polar opposites of why are you abandoning me, God? And God, you are always with me. And that's the human experience of doubt. That's the human experience of uh, not just year to year, but sometimes minute to minute. And when we're faced with great suffering, when we're faced with things that are incomprehensibly terrible and awful, we may be all of the above. We may be one moment doubting God's goodness in His existence and the next moment praising His providence for us. And that's okay. Lamentations, chapter 1. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see how worthless I have become. Is it nothing to you? All you who pass by, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which is brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Kohelet, the famous Ecclesiastes, vanity, everything is vanity. I've looked under the sun high and low and all is vanity. That's in scripture. This is not in the, the, the rebuttal to scripture where faithful people write everything they know that's favorable and good and happy and bright about God, and then the other guys get to write a second version. This is right there in our own scripture of people struggling with the Creator. Habakkuk, read that on your own. But the same struggle, it happens. And the people who've seen suffering, who've lost their nation and have lost their identity, where's God now in these circumstances? So I believe that doubt ought to be acknowledged as a normal part of faith. It ought to be something that we speak aloud. And so people have actually bought into what I believe to an unbiblical idea that a person's faith is as strong as they are free of doubt. In other words, the, the, those who have no questions and no doubt, that's the paragon. And the people who are struggling are somehow weaker 
and less important and have a, low, a lesser role in our Christian and our other faith communities. So accordingly, believers feel a need to suppress doubt when it happens. They don't bring it up. And if you're in a pastoral care situation for people who are sick and suffering or who have suffered loss, they will not likely tell you the doubts they have in God's goodness. They will not likely express verbally that they're uncertain of God's very existence because we have created these competent communities, happy with platitudes, quick with a Bible verse, but sometimes missing those core deep questions of existence that the ancients knew we struggle with. So in the beginning, Job's comforters were good, but then they failed to listen to his own heart's anguish. And, and when things didn't work, when their platitudes didn't work or their advice didn't work, whose fault was it? It's Job's fault, obviously. He's not hearing us. We said the good things, remember what we said? And they all sort of agreed among themselves. We've given him all the right advice. Some people have seen different philosophical schools and the different speakers, and whether that's true or not is not terribly material to our time tonight. But they tried all of the arguments and all of the ideas, and they fell on deaf ears because Job is in pain. And they think their platitudes are the right thing. And the modern-day Bildads among us, the modern-day Eliphaz among us, could go to people who are pain and suffering and speak the platitudes and are shocked that they're not comforted. They're amazed that that didn't work because I told you the right thing to say. Job told them that all of their advice was proverbs of ashes. That was his, his statement about their long speeches, proverbs of ashes. Not terribly substantial, nothing to build upon. And so here's some proverbs of ashes you may have heard or may have even spoken yourself. It's all in God's will. Now, I realize that there are people in faith communities who have a very deterministic idea of God as the micromanager of every event. And in that school of thought, in that concept of the universe, uh, everything is in God's will, uh, and very little is left or nothing is left to the, the events of laws of nature or human behavior. And in that sense, they believe that's a comforting thing to say. It's in God's will that you have this cancer. It's in God's will that your infant died. It's in God's will. And that's going to fall on deaf ears. That's a proverb of ashes. That may be one thing to be spoken at a remove in an auditorium, and we can also, yes, we all agree, because no one's here suffering tonight in that sort of way. But it's a proverb of ashes. Sometimes God does things to get our attention. That makes the deity an awfully mean guy if it requires killing babies to make us appreciate things or to, to develop faith, uh, that, that, that makes him to be a, a, a terrible exchange rate of what it takes to get our attention. Um, God needed an angel. Besides being quite horrible theology about what angels are, uh, it, it sort of gives like uh, God's precedence over the life uh, is, is to make us dismiss our grief over someone who dies. Uh, it's not comforting, although people think it is in their proverb of ashes. Uh, God get, never gives us more than we can handle. That is not in the Bible. People have twisted that one several different ways to come up with that statement. Uh, and the accusation that comes from that is if you're not handling it, then you must be at fault, right? Because certainly God wouldn't have put, the, God knows how much you can tolerate and he's going to push you right up to the limit. And if you're not handling it, in other words, if you're broken in your faith or broken in your spirit or psychologically have just given up, and sometimes that can be in the extreme like suicide, then the argument God doesn't give us more than we can handle uh, becomes if things don't go well, whose fault? It's our fault, right? And it makes us the, the, the frail people who've let God down because he already knew, read the tea leaves on what we should be able to do. Uh, but for the grace of God, there go I. Now, I realize that's spoken sort of proverbial, proverbially sometimes, but try to avoid that one because it makes the implication of good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, that direct me mechanistic way of looking at things. And it's okay to be grateful and it's okay to be appreciative, uh, but it also tends to diminish the humanity of the person you're referring to. 
bad things happen to them, they didn't have God's grace. But thankfully I did because God loves me more. Uh, I'm one of his absolute favorites. Um, I must be living right when something favorable happens to us. I realize, again, we say that lightly and tritely, but I would suggest that you avoid it because it is suggesting that direct mechanistic relationship that I don't believe happens. And I don't believe it's healthy to communicate that even inadvertently. Everything happens for a purpose. Examine that one for a minute and you'll find that it's a proverb of ashes. It's not built on very much because it doesn't claim what the purpose is and it doesn't claim the, the means or mechanism that the purpose brings about. It just sort of is a delaying tactic. It's not an answer, uh, but it, it, has the, the, it has the aura of wisdom without any heart, anything to it. So uh, there are all kinds of variations of what I'm going to call a deuteronomistic theology of direct cause and effect, which I think is a faulty way of understanding things. Dorothy Neville said, the real art of conversation is not only to say the right thing at the right place, but to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. <laughs> the tempting moment speaks to worthless physicians because sometimes we would like to say, well, now that you bring it up, I think I know why you have this lung cancer, or I think I know why you have this heart attack, or I think I know why your husband left you. Those kinds of tempting things to come that we're going to have an opportunity for a little evangelical evangelism moment or a little corrective action uh, is not the right time. It's not the right place when someone's suffering. Uh, and so silence may be your best wisdom. What I would hope to promote, and this is not a phrase that I've come up with, it's a borrowed phrase from a number of chaplaincy programs in hospitals and other settings, is to promote a ministry of presence. That our, our comfort may be best provided by merely being there. By not running away, by not avoiding the person when they don't look like themselves, by not avoiding the person when they're expressing doubt, by not running away and saying, I can't have fellowship with you, doubter who struggles with God's reality and his existence. Person who's making me uncomfortable with their health situation, person who's demanding way too much of my time, but rather a ministry of presence may be a level of comfort of human interaction and human communication, not interpretation at this juncture. This is not the time for it, but not running away communicates far more. So the first seven days, ministry of presence of the three friends. It's only after that that they become worthless physicians. There's something valuable about being an abiding witness to the suffering. To be someone who sees it and acknowledges it and names it for what it is. By calling injustice, injustice. By calling suffering, suffering. We echo the, the values of our Creator. There is a common statement Someone comes in the emergency room and they're bleeding. The third year medical student is paralyzed with fear and not sure what to do. And the cry will come out, don't just stand there, do something. Seems like the three stooges said that a lot. I'm not sure why, but this, that, that action is necessary. Don't just stand around, do something. But in a ministry of presence, it's quite the reverse. That sometimes don't just do something, stand there. Stand there unmoved, stand there unmovable, stand there with a presence that doesn't shy away from things that are difficult and things that are sad and things that are troubling, but to remain present in a ministry of presence. Susan Silk is a clinical psychologist who was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple years back. Uh, and she created what she called the circle of fetching Josh, you may have to help me with my Yiddish. I'm not perfect with it. But, uh, uh, but she said that in this diagram that we'll show you in just a minute, that there, that there are roles that we have in the time of crisis and the time of illness, that you comfort in and you complain or dump out. So here's a ring. 
in the very center of the ring is the person who's suffering. That's the person in the hospital bed or the person who's had lost a, a family member. And in the immediate ring around that are the people closest to them, a spouse or a child. And in the next ring may be their closest friends. And the next ring may be their faith community. And then it's like, you know, neighbors and coworkers, and the ring gets larger and larger. But the problem is often that people complain in. There's the person suffering, and they get the complaint of, I'm having to spend all my time taking care of you. I'm spending all of my time taking you to the doctor. Or a friend is saying, it's really upset me that she's not at work anymore, to the family member who's worried about they're going to live or die. And this human nature of seeing things from your own perspective and not looking at the big picture, not putting yourself in the other's shoes, tends to create far more distress than comfort. So here's what your role is. For people who are closer to the issue to, than you, all you can do is comfort. You can reflect, say, that must be hard for you. I can tell that's stressful for you. I'm certain that you're not sleeping as well as you ought to and then offer help in the way you can. And the closer you get to the person in the center of the ring, then that comfort is more immediate to that person. But don't complain. But you can complain out. Sometimes we have to vent those things. Sometimes we have to express our own emotions and feelings. So if you got to, do it to somebody who's even further removed than you are so that you're not heaping accusation or pressure or, or extra pain upon the person. If we're going to be better comforters, better physicians in that sense, uh, Silk's model is a good one. It's another image of the same one. So the sick or sad person in the middle. So we comfort in and dump out. There's great wisdom in the simplicity of this. Uh, and it's something we can model in our faith communities, something we can teach people to understand. Uh, it's not often about you. It's about someone else. So when you are in the position to comfort a friend, you are blessed you're not distressed, you're not punished. You're blessed because you have an opportunity to express your love and caring. One of the things that suffering does for us is it gives us that opportunity to talk about the eternal. It gives us an excuse to talk about the things that really matter, not about the weather or how terrible the Tennessee Volunteers have been playing or the television shows on, but things that are critical and eternal. It gives us a license to talk about those things. And so you've been blessed when you're in the presence of people who are suffering. And so for many of us, supporting people going through a difficult time can be confusing. It can be awkward. But no matter how much, we want to be present for them. So here's some suggestions that might be helpful. And not all of these will apply in every situation, but we'll give a chance to review those and to consider those. Just some ideas on how can we be better physicians and not a build ad. So be present emotionally. And so uh, it's hard to do this sometimes because it's stressful. But to consider yourself a repository, a vessel of love and accepting, to be present for that person. A ministry of presence communicates that you're willing to be there and not run away. It is true, though, that you're going to have emotions. The closer you are to the person suffering, your emotions will be real. And understand that and take care of yourself when you need to. This is not the time, however, for professional reserve. Uh, Sir William Osler, a wonderful physician and influential teacher, talked about uh, the physician's equanimitas. He should have equanimity. So in times of stress, and he sort of had that sort of pseudo-Victorian Canadian way of looking at the world. Uh, and he said, in times of stress, the physician should be of even keel and demeanor in all circumstances, that nothing perturbs him. And so the desirable physician quality of a prior generation was imperturbable so that you communicate calm in a time of crisis. Love Osler, but that's a bad idea. It's okay to get upset if you're a doctor. It's okay to cry when you're emotional. It's okay to sometimes go, I'm not sure what to do. Don't dismiss your humanity for some bizarre ideal of what a physician ought to be. Listen to their story. So storytelling is part of our region, right? The Jonesboro Storytelling Festival and ETSU has storytelling. Being present to listen to the story, even if it's recounted multiple times, validates the pain and suffering they're feeling. And recounting it allows the person to work through it in a way that sometimes comes to realizations, sometimes comes to 
acknowledgement and can create a more peaceful circumstance for someone. So listen to the story, even if it's the third time you've heard it. Even if sometimes the cast of characters is always painted in a little different light from the perspective of the person suffering, that's okay. Listen to the story. Keep your personal stories to yourself. Some of the most miserable, worthless comforters I know of apparently do uh, beauticians and barbers. And what I mean by that is, is that we have people who have a medical problem and they heard from someone at church or someone in their, 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 who cuts their hair that they should do this and not this. You should take this pill and not this. You should see this surgeon and not that surgeon. Well, what I would do if I were you, that kind of communication is a miserable comfort. This is not the time to tell your story and it's also not the time for one-upsmanship. Oh, you were in labor for four hours? I was in labor for 24 hours. Oh, your tumor was three centimeters, mine was five and a half. Oh, you were in the hospital for two weeks, I was there for three weeks. You know, that kind of one-upsmanship that sometimes is human nature, but it's not comforting. It's, it's taking the attention in the wrong direction. It's moving the attention to, I'm the hero in this story. I'm the center of attention, and that's not what we should do. So even if you've got an amazing story, bite your tongue. Keep your silence, because it's not as pertinent as you think it is. Make contact, physical, personal contact with a person suffering. I realize technology gives us some great things now with email and FaceTimes and those kinds of things, but for contact and make that an intentional, ongoing contact. Sometimes we're really good about contact right after the emergency, right after the death, right after the illness, and as time goes on, we're back in our normal life and we've forgotten about them. I talked to the pastoral care students today. They said, there's an element that you've got to count your sheep to know who's missing and who have we not contacted lately and who have we not actually uh, engaged with. So make contact. You probably really don't know how your friend feels. So don't say that. It invalidates that if you say, I know how you feel, you're telling them, quit talking about it. Don't tell me about your suffering. I already know, I already know, I already know. I got it, I got it, I know. So even if you've had a very similar experience, you're not the same person. You don't have this quite the same values or the same support system or the same family background. So you don't know how they feel, and don't say that. Be patient. It's not a climb of crisis to recovery that's just a steady, you know, smooth slope. Uh, that there's going to be times that it's frustrating. There's going to be times when it's taxing, and there's going to be times when you're exhausted, and when you don't see anything getting better, and you go, why am I doing this? Be patient. Healing and recovery takes time. Rally support. Uh, this is especially true for people in pastoral jobs. If you are uh, the pastoral person, the rabbi or minister for your congregation, everyone else will be delighted for you to take the role as the person who visits the sick. If you, if you take on that role, they'll be happy to let you have it. And they will consider themselves to be participating. We pay her she goes to the hospital, we are participating in hospital visitation as a church. So as a person who might have opportunity, rally support, engage and involve other people in the body relationship of church and group. You're gonna give them a job to do, but you're gonna be making the body healthier to look after one another, so rally support. Offer practical help. Don't say, if there's anything I can do, let me know. It's too open. They will not likely tell you, but say, can I run some errands for you? I'm going to be going to the mall. I'm going to Walgreens. Do you need something? Guess what? Uh, I notice your yard's not mowed. I'm going to mow it for you, and you can mow mine when you feel better. Particular help, not global, open-ended, let me know if you need something, because we don't tend to answer those with any kind of positive sense, because we feel like we're imposing to suggest something. So suggest the particulars and let them know that you're available for that. Let's people cry. Some people are more uncomfortable with that than others, but allow it. It's the way we're built. It's the way we're put together. And so crying is a natural human emotion, and sometimes it's the best thing to do. Uh, there are times when it can become dysfunctional. There are times when it's inappropriate, but not all crying is bad. In fact, it's good, and cry with them. It's actually scriptural. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Don't push. 
and be a buddy. I think one of the problems with uh, Job's friends were is that they saw themselves as his counselors, his superiors. And Job actually said, I'm not inferior to you to be instructed. So when you go to help someone, you're not the senior partner in the team to provide help and to be the counselor and to give advice. Be a peer. Do something that where you are equals. If it's a pastime or something fun that you can do, a presence together where you are in the same plane in terms of your relationship and dynamic. That's much more healing than someone who comes in in an official role or in a superior role. So I will take care of all of this for you. That's not what's often needed. Check in over time. Encourage basic functioning. So pay attention to you know, nutrition and rest and clothing. And this is obviously applicable in some situations and not others. Take care of yourself. This is the thing we tell medical students, Mike, is that in a time of a, a cardiac arrest, check your own pulse first. Then check the person's pulse. And there's a little bit of truth to that, is that you're not going to be much help if you're panicked. Uh, but take care of yourself because the caregivers are incredibly stressed in some circumstances of illness and loss. The caregivers also need comfort in, in a way that we can be better physicians for them. Beware of your own triggers. Every bad family relationship will be magnified at the time of illness. If there is an old hurt, or a mom always loved you best, or whatever that happens to be, it's gonna show up. So if you're one of those people who has a trigger, I have two brothers and they can say the wrong thing and it makes me mad. So I need to be aware of that. If I'm in a process of, of, of pastoral care and role or, or just friendship, you go, okay, he's probably gonna say something and I'm not gonna take the bait. So be aware of your triggers because you're not a good comforter if you're bringing up old wounds and fighting battles that are unrelated to the acute problem. Get professional help on board. Don't try to be everything, all things to all people. Sometimes you need help with that. When I lived in uh, Massachusetts down the road from me uh, was Rabbi Harold Kushner, uh, a rabbi in Natick, Massachusetts. And I met with him a few times as part of the local interfaith community. And he wrote a, a, a a uh, famous book on why bad things happen to good people. Uh, he had, had a child who died in, in, at a very young age and that tragedy led him to wrestle with those kinds of things. And, 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 and in fact, wrestling was, was quite a good uh, metaphor for what this is, to try to understand these ancient questions of theodicy. He said, is there an answer to a question of why bad things happen to good people? And the response would be to forgive to forgive the world for not being perfect, to forgive God for not making a better world, to reach out to the people around us and to go on living despite it all. No longer asking why something happened, but asking how we will respond, what we intend to do now that it has happened. It's an idea of forward thinking. I could spend a long time talking about the value of forgiveness. And I would encourage local faith communities to do studies of forgiveness because it has tremendous benefit in mental health and physical health and spiritual health. Forgiveness of all of the things that we harbor that are, that are, that are latched on to us that keep us from being free to be the people we could be is often because we fail to forgive. But this is always turning the crisis into a forward look uh, that, that, that in the wrestling and in the doubt, it looks forward. So wrestling with God, Rabbi Kushner's metaphor, that's an old metaphor. We talked about metaphors some yesterday. Uh, I will spend another time, that's not going to project well, but a, a poet by Rilke uh, translated into English talking about wrestling with the things that, that he feared. Painting by Gauguin. Now these Cape Breton women are looking on while Jacob wrestles an angel of the Lord. And the, the, what Gauguin was showing here is they'd heard this story in their sermon and they're picturing it happening. That story of Jacob running away from Laban in the Mesopotamian area to come back to the land of Israel. And he's running away from a father-in-law who's not so happy with him. And he's also fearing a twin brother who's maybe out to get him all those years later. And in the night, the story tells near the Jabbok River that he wrestles with the Lord or an angel of the Lord all night 
And they're fairly evenly matched, these two, and the wrestling goes on until an injury to his thigh. And Jacob, the heel grasper, continues and says, Bless me. And he's given a new name. And one of the folk etymologies of that name is Israel, he who wrestles with God. That's certainly been the story of faith communities since that time. Jewish and Christian and Muslim and others is that in our walk with God, we're wrestling with who is this and why does he do what he does and what does it mean for me and why do people suffer and why do bad things happen to good people and also why do good things happen to bad people? That frustrates people even more sometimes. And so we become a community of Israel as Jews and Christians and others if we continue that wrestling with God. And so doubt is healthy. Doubt is part of faith. And we'll be better physicians and better comforters to recognize that when we doubt and when others doubt, this is not something to be shunned and run away from, but part of the faith journey that we all have. I appreciate your attention tonight. Thank you.